because it's pretty evident that, you know, remember, you know, Carson doesn't want to be here. I, I, I've, you know, I've said that consistently. You're listening to the Jacob Media Sports Network in partnership with AM 1490 Sports Betting Radio. Subscribe to the Jacob Media channel on YouTube for access to all daily sports content. All right, welcome back. And you heard the man. Make sure that you subscribe to the Jacob Media YouTube channel, J-A-K-I-B Media. Uh, John McMullen and I talk every single night now at 730 For all the latest on the Eagles, NFL, and whatever else we feel like talking about, Luke Burgandy, co-founder of PropSwap, he is hanging out with us here tonight. He hangs out with me every Monday, live in studio for the first half of the show, but let's get down to business. NFL Eagles insider John McMullen, phillyvoice.com, si.com, and host of Extending the Play every Saturday right here on 1490 from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. John Welcome to your new 7.30 slot. How you doing? Uh, doing well, except for the snow. A uh, little bit of an issue today, but could have been worse. What, uh, what uh, did you end up getting up by you? Because we were just a lot of, you know, wet, sleet, nastiness, but not, not too much actually stuck to the ground. I guess you uh, were dealing with other, uh, other issues. Yeah, I, I'm more directly uh, in... in sort of western South Jersey, right near Philadelphia. So we're at about, I would say, six inches, but it's still coming down. All right. Well, you know, hopefully you get through this. But uh, before <laughs> before we get Someday. to – Yeah, yeah, you'll, you know, you'll get there. Before we get to some Eagles notes, I, I just wanted to start off quickly. There was a trade over the weekend, and now we can even bring it full circle to locally. Jared Goff for Matthew Stafford, and of course – what does Eagles Twitter do? Well, what can you get for Carson Wentz? <laughs> you know, that's that's the price for Stafford and vice versa for Jarrett Goff. Um, so part one of the question is just your thoughts on that trade uh, and your thoughts on the reaction locally. Well, the trade, I, I, I mean, I, I think it's interesting uh, from really particularly the Rams standpoint because they kind of think they're Super Bowl contenders. And uh, understandably so, and, and Sean McVay uh, essentially thinks he's a quarterback away, and he wasn't sold on Jared Goff. None of this I disagree with him on. Uh, I am always been kind of a Matthew Stafford guy. I think he's underrated. I think he's a good quarterback, but we'll see. He's never been able to, to win a playoff game in Detroit. Obviously, that's been a bad organization for most of his stay. So it's difficult to put everything on his shoulders. But I will say, you know, both of them are on notice now because obviously that Rams team has enough talent to make the playoffs. We've seen them make the playoffs with Jared Goff. So in theory, they should take a a step up wherever that lands then at least. And then from Sean McVay's standpoint, look, he's got to prove it as well. I I mean, here's a guy who essentially was going to bench his starting quarterback for a nobody who was playing in the XFL. Uh, and 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 go in a different direction. Had it not be for had it not been for an injury, and all of a sudden Goff comes back in, it's interesting from so many levels. But locally, and that's what everybody cares about with the Philadelphia Eagles. I I, I do think it makes it more likely that the Eagles can trade Carson Wentz. But it, it's not about the trade itself. It's not about what the Lions got back from Matthew Stafford, nothing like that. It just shows you the thought process of the NFL is changing a little bit to where teams will go that sort of NBA route or that Major League Baseball route where they are willing to pay a premium to get rid of a toxic asset, as you call it. And that's what the, that's what Carson Wentz is right now because of the contract, uh, because of all the issues. Uh, because of his unhappiness, it's a toxic asset. Typically, the NFL in the past, they didn't do that. Now, uh, newer people in charge, more open-minded, they're starting to think that way. 
It's interesting because, you know, you and I have talked every night at 1030 on my old time slot just about um, as the coaching staff started to come together. And it's basically fully together here now. And we'll get to that in a second. But question. Oh, boy, we got a new one. We, yeah, we got to get to that. Yeah, we will. But, you know, before we do, just real quick, you know, how are they – how are they piecing together this coaching staff puzzle and with what in mind? So is this, you know, with the thought of this is the coaching staff that is going to fix Carson Wentz, or this is the coaching staff that can work with either Carson and Jalen and, or none of the above. But now that this trade happened just a day or two ago here over the weekend, is Jeffrey Lurie saying, oh, man, well, maybe I can do something that I didn't think I could. Um, you know, just, just your thoughts on all of that. No, I, I, you know, I've been heavily critical of Jeffrey Lurie throughout this process, uh, really since, you know, the past couple seasons of, of starting to to overreach a little bit and, and become more of a uh, a meddling owner, for lack of a better term. But uh, even I won't go down that road to think he would hire a, a head coach and by extension a coaching staff to, to for one player. I mean, that's insanity. That's not how you do it. The shelf life for any player uh, in this league can be so short. You know, you can think you have something. If you think about Nick Sirianni and where he came from, you know, the Indianapolis Colts in 2018, him and Frank Reich are probably thinking, all right, we got Andrew Luck healthy. We're going to have this guy for 10 years. We're going to be in a consistent playoff contender. We're going to be in this thing, and they're probably giddy. And what happens? August, the next season, rolls around. I think it was, you know, late August, 24th, 25th, two weeks before the season. He he just says, you know what? I'm tired. I'm tired of trying to get ready, tired of the rehab to keep my body in shape. And he walked away from the game. So you, my point being, you can never assume – that somebody's going to be here for 10 or 15 years in this league. So many things can can uh, knock that train off the track, so to speak. So if you're hiring a head coach for one football player, especially one who played as poorly as Carson Wentz, look, I criticize Jeffrey Lurie a lot. But, but no, he's not that dumb. He, and there's just absolutely no way. Uh, never say never. No, but uh... – I'm with you. I don't. I think that is a little bit too idiotic. All right, so let's get to some more news surrounding the coaching staff. Fill us in, John. Well, we got the youngest one. <laughs> yes, uh, and Nick Rollis is going to be the new linebackers coach, and he comes from uh, Minnesota, where he was the assistant linebackers coach. He's 27 years old. Uh, I think he's going to be 28, could be 28, uh, turning 29. Either way, he's the youngest one yet. Um, came straight basically off the University of Minnesota football team, you know, quality control guy. Um, and he's worked with some good linebackers. I mean, Eric Kendricks is one of the best linebackers in football. Anthony Barr uh, is tremendous. So from that standpoint, okay. But, man, we've talked about the youth on this coaching staff. Um, again, a guy who's never been a full-time position coach. Now he's coming in uh, to coach linebackers. At that age, <laughs> Alex Singleton, who barely plays, is, it could be older. It, it, and, you know, you have to start to wonder. Um, and the special teams coordinator, uh, which we've mentioned, Michael Clay, he's 29 years old. He's the youngest coordinator in the NFL. Uh, and then the big wigs, Sirianni's 39, Jonathan Gannon, the defensive coordinator, and he worked with Nick Rollis in Minnesota, so that's probably the connection, uh, is 37, Shane Steichen's 35. I, I mean, I, I don't want it, it, it's, I, I'll tell you what, man, uh, maybe it hits a home run, but I, I don't know uh, if you're trying something new here to say, let's connect to players. Let's get guys closer to their age, and we'll see how it works. But I, I, I'm a little hesitant when I look at the experience on this coaching staff. And, you know, Nick Rallis is, you know, he's probably most famous for his brother, who is uh, Michael Rallis, but he's better known as Riddick Moss. 
who is a WWE star. And Nick looks like he could be a WWE star. So it's an interesting coaching staff, to say the least. Yeah, and just to touch on the youth once again, and we're talking with NFL Eagles insider John McMullen. Follow John on Twitter at JFMcMullen, phillyvoice.com, si.com, and host of Extending the Play every Saturday, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. John, it's not like this coaching staff was walking around with canes and and walkers, you know, prior to this. So to go in this drastic of a situation— I, I talked about it a lot. If you could not, you know, everybody wants Sean McVay. I mean, he's the guy. He's the hot guy. Everybody thinks he's the smartest guy in the world. And, you know, I, so use him as the template. And he was the youngest coach hired in the Super Bowl era. He was 32 years old, and everybody sculpted at that. And he's been successful. He's made the playoffs three times. He's made the Super Bowl. He's won a lot of games. Um, you know, but when he started, they gave him Wade Phillips as a defensive coordinator who's been a head coach and I think five or six different places when you include interim uh, coaching stints that he went through. So point being, he's been around forever. And I, I think, you know, to me, the biggest issue is the stuff that people don't think about. You know, fans are just generally focused on the games and the X's and O's and the schemes. That job is so big. There's so many logistical things from just putting together a schedule, uh, a training camp schedule, an all-season schedule. And by the way, that's you're throwing the curveball with with COVID, and we'll see how everything works out as far as virtual but versus how much stuff you have uh, live. Uh, All of those things, that's all things that the head coach does, meeting with the media four or five times a week, pre-production meetings uh, with TV broadcasts. Uh, every single coach I've ever spoken to, when you ask him what didn't you expect about this job, talks about that kind of stuff, the ancillary stuff, all the stuff you have to do that's away from football. In other words, when you're a coordinator or a position coach, you know, you're like these draft people on Twitter. All you do all day is grind film and you talk football and that. There's so many other parts to the job of being a head coach. So to not have somebody who at least understands that, at least that Nick Sirianni can use as a sounding board. Remember Doug Peterson at Jim Schwartz. And you can can look all over the place. Uh, Matt Nagy had, had, excuse me, Vic Fangio. Uh, Matt LaFleur had Mike Pettin. On and on and on and on. It's it's kind of surprising. Maybe the Eagles say, you know what? Maybe Howie Roseman says, this is young, man. Why don't we bring in a senior offensive analyst? You know, you can use any kind of title, assistant head coach. But as of right now, I'd be a little hesitant with the lack of experience in this group. All right, so I'm going to throw out my conspiracy theory, and I threw this out to you last week, John, and I think I brought it up on your show, Extending the Play, on Saturday. Uh, So for any of the new listeners, here it is. Howie Roseman and Jeffrey Lurie are intentionally doing this so they can be more hands-on. They sit Nick uh, Nick Sirianni down in in the office and, listen, you're going to be calling plays for the first time. You're going to be head coach for the first time. You have a very young staff around you. Our door is always open. You come to us with any questions, anything you need to delegate to us to assist you with. We got your back, bro. And they really are just sharpening the knives. <laughs> well, I will say, I like it. It's diabolical. Uh, as Bugs Bunny would say, diabolical. But I, I don't buy it. I, I mean, my, my theory on that is they're in charge. They can do whatever the hell I want to begin with. So... In other words, it's, you know, they don't have, it's not like Nick Sirianni, they're giving him a chance out of nowhere. He's not getting another head head coaching job. Um, They're giving him the opportunity. They already have all the power. So they don't have to go through these back doors and say, uh, what I'm surprised about is the opposite. And the fact that they've said, okay, go hire your coaches and we're not going to, we're not going to bother. I think already they got to be sitting in an office somewhere thinking about this 
well, and, and Jeffrey, we know it's Palm Beach. He's got to be saying, uh, what, he's bringing in half of the road warriors, essentially, to be his linebackers coach at 28 years old. I mean, if somebody gets hurt, Nick might go in there and play. <laughs> I, I, you know, and, and you go from Ken for Joel, who, be, you know, he, he was uh, a, a veteran guy. He might retire now. He's in his 60s. And it's not about age. But my point is, he was a former defensive coordinator with the Rams. He had been coaching for uh, over 30 years. I, I mean, the dramatic shift is, is just a little bit weird. Now, coaches are coaches, and that's what happens in this league. You hire your friends, and you can see it throughout this coaching staff. You know, uh, Nick worked with uh, Scott Steichen with the Chargers. Uh, he worked with Gannon with the Colts. Gannon worked with Tracy Rocker, who's the defensive line coach, one of the older coaches. He worked with Rollis, who's going to be the linebackers coach, and on and on and on. You can see it with the notable exception of the two guys that are holdovers so far, Jeff Stoutland and, and Aaron Moorhead's going to stay as the receivers coach, which is a bit of a surprise and lends me to indicate they couldn't find another receivers coach, to be honest. Um, but it, it's – it's to me it's the exact opposite and I'm surprised that Jeffrey and Howie have said to this guy hire who you want because he's hiring who he wants and it's a bunch of guys who've never done it before John I'm I'm curious your thoughts on uh, Nick Sirianni's opening press conference last Thursday I think we still have to give the award of worst press conference to Dan Campbell with the biting of the kneecaps I will say I believe a close runner-up is Nick Sirianni talking about his smart system that was the last thing I would describe his speech as smart <laughs> because I have no idea what he was talking about last week in that press conference. Uh, your thoughts? Well, I'm not a big win or lose press conference guy. I will tell you as a reporter that Dan Campbell's was a home run. I disagree. We love that. That's what we want. We want the biting kneecaps. We want – a guy with personality. One thing about it, Nick Sirianni, yeah, he he looked a little bit bad, and I said he should have he shouldn't have opened with the with the note cards and 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 the big opening statement. He should have just you know thanked a few people, Frank Reich and Mr. Laurie, blah blah blah, and moved on into the question format. I think it would have flowed a little bit better for him. But yeah, he he was nervous, and that's understandable. Now he talked on the Eagles flagship radio station today. And he was much better, but from, from, again, from just a reporter standpoint, nobody cares, but look, you can tell this guy is just playing the hits. As I called it, I wrote about it on sports illustrated today. He's going to say the same thing over and over and over again. He talked about competition. He talked about that in his press conference. He talked about getting a Ph.D. in leadership from Frank Reich. He talked about that in his press conference. This guy's going to be boring. Now, that doesn't mean he can't be a good coach, but if you go back to, say, Andy Reid, who didn't give you anything, uh, at least in front of the camera, he would give you some things behind the camera. Um, but, you know, fans, would it would drive them crazy when he would say, i got to do a better job. That's what you're going to get with this guy. It's going to be cliches, coach talk, blah, blah, blah. Whereas at least with Dan Campbell, man. Yeah, let's talk about biting kneecaps. At least that's interesting. Yeah, we've all been there. Um, we're talking with our NFL Eagles insider, John McMullen. Follow John on Twitter, at JF McMullen. So you mentioned a uh, new article up on SI.com. Also the article up uh, at phillyvoice.com, which is topics that we've just uh, touched on here tonight, the shift toward NBA-like thinking. Uh, and, and I want to get back to that for a second, John. Do you think that Jeffrey Lurie has made, and, and this cannot be answered with any type of certainty, but your thoughts uh, as a longtime insider, do you think he has made any feeler-like calls uh, to other teams? And if he hasn't, after this trade, will he do so now, because you and I talked last week about the potential uh, toxic environment that could really take place this season if Carson Wentz comes out the gates struggling like he did this past season. 
Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, the way the NFL works now, I'm sure he sent out feelers because it's pretty evident that, you know, remember, you know, Carson doesn't want to be here. I, I, I've, you know, I've said that consistently. Now, just because he doesn't want to be here doesn't mean the Eagles can trade him. I mean, their biggest hurdles are, are getting someone to trade for him. Now, you, you think about this trade, guys. You know, this is two teams that were in the quarterback market. They're now out of the quarterback market. So that's two less teams you have to deal with right off the top of the the, the, the top of the deck, so to speak. Uh, you have the dead money, which I talked about a lot. Remember, the Rams had the dead money record. They just set it again with Jared Goff. But it went from $21.8 million to $22.2 million. So they kicked it up four hundred thousand dollars. That's like uh, that's how precedents go. You raise it a little bit. The Eagles to set the precedent would have to raise that by eleven million more dollars. That's a hurdle. That is a big hurdle. Uh, and then you talk about the draft, which we'll get into in, in the coming weeks, and all the guys. You know, Trevor Lawrence is going one, but after that, you know, Zach Wilson's going top ten. Um, You know, Justin Fields is going top 10. Trey Lance might even go top 10. So if you're one of those quarterback-hungry teams, would you rather have the young guy under a cost-effective rookie contract for five years, or do you want to pay Carson Wentz, who's taken some really big hits from a reputation standpoint? Remember that. Forget about the field. From a reputation standpoint of being disgruntled, you want to pay him $25 million? The Eagles... Uh, Carson wants to be traded. The Eagles might even want to trade him, but it's just not that easy. No, it's not, and that's something that we've talked a lot about uh, here on the show over the past couple months, really throughout the um, entire second half of the season up until now. Uh, John, we've talked about the CEO approach that is required uh, when you're a head coach in the National Football League. We've talked about the youth of the staff well, let's look at the players' side of things. And Malcolm Jenkins was known as a player coach type uh, when when he was still in Philadelphia. You look at Jason Kelsey. Uh, you typically look at the quarterback, but I, I don't know how much we want to look at that right now. As okay, Carson is a leader. When he speaks, the locker room's going to listen. I think Lane Johnson is going to be an important leader in that locker room, but. Um, what's that going to look like? And I, I ask that because I think it's even more important this year with the youth of the coaching staff. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be something we all have an eye on to see how this coaching staff relates to the players, especially the veteran players that have been here for a while and have had success. And we'll see if Jason Kelsey returns. He, he's in that group. And you mentioned Lane Johnson, Fletcher Cox, Brandon Grant. I, I mean, you look at you look at Brandon at, at 33 years old. I just mentioned, you know, uh, he's almost as old as his coordinator. He's older uh, than the linebackers coach. He's older than the special teams coach. And, you know, it's a weird kind of kind of thing, and, and we'll see how that shakes out uh, as things move forward. But that's one of the things that. You know, Nick Sirianni's got to get through this, and it's not just age. It's not just experience. Remember, he's also got to get through this locker room as far as uh, Deuce Daly and, and, and how many of these guys were lobbying for Deuce to get this job. And Jeffrey Lurie listened to that lobbying, presumably, although who knows if he did, um, and went in another direction. So he's got to win them over from that standpoint, from a lot of these guys who like Deuce, was re- were really pulling for Deuce, and now there's a new guy, and you better hit a home run. We talk about first impressions. We talked about that that press conference. You know, first impressions to the media or the fans that's that's not that's not a big deal, um, to be honest, because you'll ultimately uh, be judged on on wins and losses. First impressions in that locker room with those players that's a big deal. So hopefully, uh, he handles that a little bit better. John McMullen, our NFL Eagles insider, dropping knowledge on us here uh, for his nightly 730 
appearance on The Fix. You can listen to John and I talk Eagles and Luke on Mondays uh, every single night at 730 on AM 1490 Sports Betting Radio. And make sure to follow him on Twitter, like I've been saying, at JF McMullen and all of his written work at phillyvoice.com and si.com. John, uh, at 8 o'clock, Luke and I are going to get into some fun prop bets and some real prop bets to hopefully make some money. So I ask you this on your way out the door. Heads or tails? Uh, Tails never fails, boys. Tails never fails. All right. I'm just... uh, Ten ten grand on tails. Yep, just cleared out my bank account. Thanks, John. No pressure. That's science. That's science right there. That is science. You can't... That's, That's data. That's analytics. Uh, that's, that's, that's 22nd. What century are we in? I don't know. <laughs> century stuff. <laughs> I'm not sure. We'll get into that when we come back though. John, I appreciate it, my friend. And, uh, we'll do it again tomorrow at seven 30. Sound good. All right. Thanks guys. Well, John. Thank you. Uh, thank you. There he is. Jay Mack, our NFL Eagles insider. Um, yeah, dude, it, it's like, I, I look at this coaching staff and, I'm not trying to be Mr. Negative Nancy. I'm not trying to say they don't have a shot. Listen, this Nick Sirianni guy and his coaching staff, they could come out to be Sean McVay 2.0. They can come out to be the next Bill Belichick, insert Hall of Fame coach here. Mm -hmm. Great. I just don't understand right now, before we get to the benefit of hindsight a year from now, whatever the case may be, you look at this right now and what this team has endured over the past couple of seasons and what they need moving forward. I don't really understand how they shaped this coaching staff. Are you with me on all of that, Luke? Yeah. And I feel like and I, we should have touched on this with John. The age of the Eagles is an old team. It's very old. Right? It's so very old. if this was a very young team, then perhaps I could maybe understand the this strategy because the, the – the delta between the age of the coaches and the age of the players is yeah. wide. This, <laughs> this is not because our our roster is so old. Yeah. Um, I question if Brandon Cox and Lane Johnson and Fletcher, uh, sorry Fletcher Cox, Brandon yeah. Graham, Lane Johnson, you know Darius Slay, mm-hmm. like are these guys who are like you know studs in the NFL going into their mid thirties, early thirties? Like, do they care what these other thirty year olds are about to tell them how to do their job? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure either, and and that's something we can get more into with John and, and maybe even later tonight. We'll see. Um, but it's early on in this tenure, early on this upcoming next season, it's going to be crucial because I think you bring up an excellent point. You have these guys. You had a Super Bowl winning head coach in that facility. Now you're bringing in a dude who's 39 years old. He's never been a head coach. He's never called plays. And if you're Fletcher Cox, Brandon Graham, Lane Johnson, Darius Slay, now you have to listen to these guys. And if you get off to a slow start, that locker room is going to be lost Mm -hmm. real quick. Mm -hmm. All right, one hour down, just like that. The Fix, 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Let's get into our top of the hour VEASAN update and break when we come back. Luke has some can't-miss props. They are guaranteed winners, ladies and gentlemen. You're not going to find that anywhere else. Stick with us live in the Prop Swap Studios.